who joins who joins you and we are live and welcome everybody to uh the seventh episode of the closure study group and uh thank you for joining uh with me is manny on the uh on the line hello manny hello how's it going it's good good lovely lovely chilly sunday morning in london yeah nice to uh, be online on closure uh, closure radio closure radio yes uh and yes, uh, with some uh, rolling stones going on in the background there was yes um i uh it's still going on in my head, so there we go. Um, hopefully, there isn't too many uh, cat in intermissions today. But uh, so today, I'm going to cover um, building some websites with Closure Scripts, so front end uh, website, just very simple stuff to start with. And uh, some of the tools we're going to use. Obviously, we're going to use Closure Scripts. Closure Script is essentially Closure, but instead of running on the Java JVM. Closure Script runs in the browser, and you can also run it in uh, Node.js as well. And and also in theory, you could run it in the in the JVM Rhino support as well. Um, today we're just going to run our Closure Script in the browser, and um, and do it that way to make that a really good experience. There's an excellent tool called FigWheel, uh, and FigWheel allows us to uh, basically update live update the browser as we're editing, as we're uh, evaluating and saving our code. We can push all those changes directly to the browser, and we can instantly see what's going on. And we're also going to use uh, a library called Reagent, which is a, gives a very simple way to actually create a web page. You can actually just create it just by writing fairly simple HTML and some simple functions and generate some code that way. If we get time, we'll also look at using scalable vector graphics and uh, Bootstrap, which are nice ways to make uh, make your website more interesting. Uh, and again, scalar vector graphics is a nice way to do graphics uh, images, uh, but are data driven as well. So, and will also scale uh, very nicely as well. So you don't have to worry about them going blurry like other uh, like pixelated pictures do. Um, so that's the plan for today. We'll see how far we get along. Uh, I'm going to share my screen briefly. I'm going to share the entire screen. Eee, there we go. And uh, I am. I do have a book, uh, a free book actually, uh, on Closure Script, but I'm going to rewrite this. So if you do start looking at this, there's a lot to to rewrite. There's some interesting stuff in here, but it does need uh, a rewrite because since I wrote this, then FigWheel and Closure Script and, and Reagent kind of thing has moved along a bit. So there's quite a lot of new projects, and we'll touch on some of that a little bit later. Um, but uh, just it's got a quite a nice. Um, uh, closure script overview here so it's kind of like a, try to visualize how you would actually where you would actually use closure script uh, as opposed to JavaScript or TypeScript and so on um, and so if you're just adding a little bit of dynamic nature to a website if you're just adding a few little bits of jQuery then that's not really where closure script really shines um, uh, so people either do like simple web apps and they write a little bit of uh, dynamic sections to the website by using jQuery um, or they or they kind of like yeah try and do some weird things so if to try and build too much complexity with jQuery then you get into this kind of uh, development hell that's quite tricky so this is why we have things like react uh, angular js and ember and things like that. these these libraries will come help you build this kind of like this approach to uh, development called single page apps so your your application your web page is a, a whole single page app you don't really need to kind of switch between pages because that requires going back to the the server side so you've basically got it's like having a desktop application but inside your your web page as well mm -hmm. so we we'll touch on some of those things as we as we go along but that's this is kind of where you would use um, uh, React. Uh, this would use where you would use uh, Closure Scripts, and so we're actually going to use Closure Scripts with React because uh, Reagent is is a React uh, library, a library over over the top of React, uh, but it just makes it very easy to to use that as well. It takes away some of the complexity. You're doing all of this in the Emacs, right? Uh, yes, I believe so. If it all, all works, right. it should okay. work. Yes. Yeah. And so the way it's often, uh, so what we do with Closure Scripts is, is it's often you 
termed as transpiling. It's actually really is. We really are compiling uh, closure scripts. Uh, and instead of generating uh, Java bytecode and Java classes like we do on the JVM with closure script, we're actually creating JavaScript. So we're actually creating JavaScript that will run pretty much on any platform. And we use the, um, I don't know if I've got a link here, we, we use the closure uh, compiler from Google, which is the other spelling of closure. So we do Google closure. Um, there's a whole set of development tools around here that Google have built to actually make um, their front end uh, applications work really, really nicely. So things like Google Maps, uh, Gmail, all these things use this uh, closure compiler and closure libraries. And uh, it's a very powerful uh, set of tools. And uh, most importantly, it, it it does a lot of work to minimize uh, how the, the footprint of your application. When you're delivering sort of applications in the web, then one of the aspects to kind of think of in terms of performance is how long it actually takes to load up. So if you go to Google Mail, then it does take a few seconds to, to load up, but it's um, it's putting in a lot of functionality into that web page. And so uh, the Google com Closure compiler, Closure with an S, that does uh, some really nice optimizations uh, for uh, for you, and also does dead code uh, elimination as well. So if you've got code in your Closure scripts uh, and you push it through the Google Closure compiler, then it will actually strip out all the code that you're actually not using. Uh, so it does it does make a nice, very lightweight. Um, uh, deployment of closure script as well uh, but you don't really need to know how to use that it's all built into the tooling of closure script as well and it just it's just useful to know that you can actually get some efficient uh, efficient applications out the end so you're not sacrificing any performance by using closure scripts and in some situations you might actually get uh, a more performant application by using closure script than JavaScript uh, because you're using this Google closure compiler uh, and you can, yeah, so here is just a kind of simple graphic to show you. You can do closure script on Nashorn, which is the engine inside Java. You can do it on Node as well. Um, there's also something called Shadow CLGS, which allows you to basically use all the NPN packages really easily. Uh, so you can build a, a, a full stack uh, application just on closure script. Um, but I think most people are actually focusing in just building out front-end applications for the browser. That seems to be the most common usage of Clojure, uh, Clojure Script, sorry. And uh, there's also some self-hosting uh, tools as well. So you can actually, uh, I haven't put a link in there yet, but you can actually self-host it. There's uh, Plank and Lumo projects, which allow you to yeah, basically just have Clojure Script on there. And that's quite useful for building uh, like command line tools as well. Uh, and if you want to build command line tools, you can also like deploy them on Node.js, and they've got a very nice, very quick startup time. You don't have the overhead of uh, the JVM startup time, which occasionally can be a little bit uh, noticeable, um, especially if on, in some kind of command line tool that you're running all the time, whereas Node is, is kind of a nice way to approach that as well. So, and I think you can yes. also do uh, some of this via the Graal version of uh, JavaScript. Graal JS. Okay. Um, so I'm actually going to look into that. So that's going to replace uh, Nashon in the future. Okay. Because uh, they've already deprecated Nashon in 11, I think. Uh, oh, okay. Right. This so is... so yeah. The first was Rhino. They deprecated Rhino and they replaced it with Nashon. And now they're going to replace uh, deprecate Nashon and 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 Graal JS is going to take over. So that binary will be available. Don't know where when. So I think they're suggesting you download Graal VM. Uh, okay. In the meanwhile, to do that, but okay. let's play around with it to see how we can get closure script working through that. I'll let you know what the results are. Okay, that seems to make sense. Yeah. Uh, so if you just want to stick on the JVM, so, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, then you can use uh, yeah, Graal VM sounds a really promising approach to that as well. So I think um, yeah. So I whatever way you deploy it, you can you can basically build a full stack application using closure using the closure syntax, and then you could decide how you want to deploy that closure uh, code, uh, either on the JVM or on in the browser or on uh, or Node.js or a combination of any of those. 
um, uh, because it's 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 the same language more or less. There's a couple of things that uh, uh, don't quite work because uh, JavaScript doesn't uh, support them. Uh, things like the ratio type, but uh, 99 percent, 99.9 percent of all the stuff is is very well supported, including some of the libraries. Most of the libraries are very easy to convert over as well. And what else is there? Uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty much the same. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this because I want to get on with some uh, closure. But yeah, the tooling um, is so you can still use lining in. There's also a new project called uh, Figwheel Main, which kind of uses the new closure script command line uh, interface tools. But we're we're going to stick with lining in now because that's what, again that's what most people are using. Uh, you can get a nice interactive workflow, so you can have. Um, with the video, there we go. So you can have your code uh, in one side and your browser on the other side. And uh, as you're coding, then you can actually see. So here we've got uh, it's a bit small, but we're typing some text and we're actually affecting how the game is being played. Uh, and as we continue to develop, then we can actually see live as we're evaluating stuff, we can see uh, the what our code is actually doing. So this is a great way to. Uh, actually develop the application uh, because you can see you don't have to compile and wait for it to do things so you can actually compile you can actually run this straight away if you've done some JavaScript stuff you can pro you can usually get this uh, configured but this is pretty much out of the box with uh, with fig wheel um, and so then yeah so you can play the game and then you can decide to turn the, uh, the collision detection on or off so you can see so you can go to the end of the game without uh, having to be able to play the game. And then as if you can test different aspects of the game very, very easily. Um, so for game development, this is great, but it also is just as good for like web development. So you can see what your web page looks like as you're building it as well. Is that recompiling it every time, or is it just compiling that aspect of it that, that I've changed? How does that work? Uh, yeah, so it's going to compile the new bits, and it's basically going to uh, push uh, like. DOM, if you're using Reagent, it's going to push DOM changes to that. Uh, ah, but yeah, okay. so but Figwheel is is basically compiling a new version. It's going to inject the new versions of JavaScript into into the browser uh, for you. Uh, ah, I see. And, uh, so yeah. it's quite efficient as opposed to doing the whole thing and redeploying. Oh yeah, as you'll see, it's 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 kind of you can see it, it's it's happening in less than less than a second. Kind of usually, mm. it usually pops up a, a little kind of. Um, Closure script logo, so you can see uh, a new version has been running. But um, yeah, and you get good, uh, oops, you get good error, pretty good error messages as well in there as well. And, um, dum, dum, is it? Good. Uh, and there's lots of people. I mean, one example of uh, people are using uh, closure script is Circle CI. So a lot of their, I think all of their user interface. Uh, so this is an online, uh, yeah. Uh, continuous integration service, and uh, that's all written in ClojureScript. And I think it's all, all the front end code is actually available on GitHub if you want to go and see how somebody's built a large application uh, very well. Um, so, uh, one of the things you would uh, do is so you can create a FigWheel project. Uh, and that's that's fairly easy to do. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice template. I use this uh, FigWheel template. And we're going to use uh, Reagent to actually, uh, we're going to add the, a Reagent option to this template. So it's going to build as a very simple uh, framework for a web page, a very simple project for a web page, and uh, just inject the Reagent libraries into that as, as it creates it. Uh, and there's, uh, there's more details on the actual line FigWheel page here as well, uh, which goes into more detail. There's also a link to FigWheel main, which we, we'll cover and a little bit more uh, towards the end, just to show you what, how this uh, project is progressing. Um, so let's get on with some coding. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the terminal. So I'm just going to create a new project in the terminal, just by using just by using lining in. Going to create a new project uh, fig, uh, using the FigWheel template, and I'm just going to call it uh, my web, uh, for want of a better word. And so that's my project name. And then we're just adding uh, an option called reagent to the fig wheel template. So this dash dash uh, means that whatever comes after this dash dash should be passed to uh, the templates uh, and, uh, and, and not be consumed by lining. And so 
this this option is going to be is not a lining an option it's an option for the the template itself and so that's how it works so we press enter as long as my internet is working then we should have a new project up and running so it's downloading a few jars there from closures um so yeah it's just getting the template to build it up and then we've got that please don't block uh, maven today john i'll try not to block maven today no i, I won't be doing uh, a massive amount of uh, dependency management uh so if i go to my web uh, all that yes i do Ooh. Oops. Oh yeah, so there we go. So this is this is essentially what it's created. Um, so we've got uh, our source uh, tree here. So it's got namespace, my web, and lining in is, is still a Java application. So it does need to have the underscores rather than the the dashes in the names. Um, so, so when you install lining in, you still need to have like a JVM to, to do that with the uh, figwheel.main. We're moving away from that. Um, and then we've got our, our main file, our core.cljs file. So we don't actually have a closure file in our source. We just have a closure script. So we've got CLJ is a closure file. CLJS is a closure script file. Uh, and there's also closure C, which is a closure common file which you write code in there that will work on regardless of any host that you're actually running on so it would work on java it would work on javascript uh, platforms as well um, so if you if you are doing a full stack uh, application then it's quite nice to put as much of the code into a closure c so cljc file uh, in there so you can then share it between uh, the different aspects of your uh, application if you need to uh, the resources web, uh, the resources folder is where you have uh, your resources. What resources they are, uh, things like uh, cascading style sheets. They are um, any JavaScript you want to put in there as well, uh, and any web pages you want to put in there, and any images. So if you're going to put images in there, you need to put them into resources public. And uh, there's a readme, is a project file which we'll have a quick look at, and then there's this uh, dev. Uh, user thing, which just helps us set up uh, FigWheel uh, and run FigWheel from like tooling as well. So we'll have a quick look at that. So let's go and open that in my favorite editor. Um, again, other editors are available. Uh, space, space, space. Where do we put this? Uh, so we put this in, uh, oops, uh, closure. How do you open terminal again inside the Emacs thing? Um, there's a shortcut. There's a um, uh, ooh, what is it? A space quote, space single quote. I think is the uh, is a shortcut if you've enabled it. Um, otherwise, it's just um, e shell. You just type, just do space space e shell. Is uh, for want of a key binding that I can't remember. Uh, my web. Okay. Uh, Projects. So I'm just going to have a very quick look at the project file. Uh, and let's see, let's make that a little bit bigger. It's very similar to a closure uh, project file. It's just some more details about where to actually build things. So we've got the usual, uh, the usual descriptions, URL, license, whatever license you want to use, the minimum version of lining in when you're going to deploy. Uh, we've got our dependencies. So we've got Clojure as a dependency. Uh, we still need Clojure for Clojure Script to run at the moment in this approach. Um, it's including core async, which I don't think we're actually going to use, uh, really, uh, not directly. And so we've got reagent. So core async is a way to basically have an, uh, an in-memory queue uh, to keep some of your code simple. So if you needed to do like more complex uh, futures and promises actually you could probably simplify that by just using a core racing queue it's a bit like channels in go if you come across those things um, but we'll have a i think we'll do a broadcast on using core racing at some point in the future we've got a few plugins we've got uh, this fig wheel plugin and this build cljs build again these are just for fig wheel is for allowing it to just to have this uh, interactive experience that we show when we're looking at flappy birds demo and CRJS build is just building our, um, building our, helping us build our applications. 
Uh, then we've got source paths to show where where the source code is that we're going to build from. Uh, and then it's just some configuration for CSJS build. Again, this is all boilerplate stuff, so you don't really need to worry about this. Um, uh, it, it's You only need to do this if you really wanted to customize something, but most people will just use the defaults because they're fairly sensible. Um, and uh, and there's fig wheel as well. Uh, so fig wheel will also pull up your if you make any changes in your CSS files, it will it will watch those and and do updates. Should you change any of the CSS, uh, and the rest of it is just some additional options you can actually um, configure. Uh, what else? And then there's profiles, which is just some development uh, tools, some development libraries. Big wheel needs to uh, to be able to do its magic, but all you really need to work with is basically uh, probably the, the only changes you're going to make to this file is if you need to add any additional dependencies. Uh, as we're just using uh, closure script and reagent, we don't need to add anything here um, ourselves. So let's look at uh, let's look at the dev. Did you just add that reagent there? Because oh, I haven't seen mine in, in my version. I didn't don't have a reagent. I got to add it. I think. Uh, yes. So if if you didn't use the or if you made a typo when you used the uh, uh, my fig will reagents. So, oh okay. Yeah, my fig will. Oh dash dash reagent. Got it. If you, don't, if you don't do this, then it will add the um, it will add the library. Ah, uh, got it. Okay, that was my bad. I must have done that. That's it. No problem. Easy mistake to make. Uh, well, good mistake to make. You learn what you're doing. Yeah. There you go. Now I'll remember for life. Well, hopefully. And and the so in this dev user, um, in this dev user CLJ file, there's just some simple commands to to help uh, the application run, and. Um, this is basically for starting and stopping fig wheel by by lining in. Uh, and so again, this isn't this isn't something you need to uh, change unless uh, unless you want to play around with stuff. It's on the based on the ideas of uh, components, which you can look at. But you don't really need to understand how this works to just make it work. Um, uh, space. And then the source code, which is the interesting part. Oh, we've got a kitty joining me. Um, Source code. Oops. Hello, Puss. No. Uh, a little bit bigger. Meow. No. Hello, Kissy. Uh, so what do we got here? Uh, so this is our this is our main uh, source code file. And um, as you can see the, from the first line that we've got to our namespace definition, which is uh, created by the template. And uh, it's got a library included, required into this namespace, which is the reagent, uh, reagent core library. And um, that will help. That will help. Obviously, we need that to be able to use reagent functions. And uh, come on. There we go. And sorry, the cat's just gone out now. So there we go. John, can you repeat that last bit? I yeah, sure. Sorry, I was just dealing with the the cat. I'm just come back in again. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So this is this is our namespace for our source code, our main source code, and um, our template has added this require um, thing there, and uh, it's. Uh, basically, just adding the library, this reagent call library. So all the functions in this library uh, we're adding, and uh, we're actually yeah. So we're referring it, the library as reagents, uh, and we're um, uh, going to include uh, atom specifically because we're going to use the reagent atom um, to to do stuff. In effect, it's only importing Atom. It's not importing other things. Uh, we can include other things, but we have to specify uh, reagents okay. uh, if we want to. Okay. If you would have just said 
react reagent dot code where input in imported everything is it right it's now yeah. it's importing only the atom okay got it. yeah so we're going to use the atom so when we use the atom here it's not the closure atom it's the actual uh reagent atom so when we when we refer something it's 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 as it's as like we've defined that inside the namespace um whereas normally you would uh you would create an alias or you would just refer you can refer all in there but typically you would create a like either an alias or you would just specify specific functions that you were going to refer into into the namespace um so how does the compiler know which one are you talking about in this context atom is taking higher priority and the any other atoms that might be in the namespace become second in priority is that how it works yeah so it will look at what's what's there locally mm -hmm. and um so in in this case yes so the reagent atom is is highest in yeah it's taking precedence over um the uh, the normal closure atom or the closure script atom Cool. And so, yeah, so there's a few things here. So there's um, there's this enable console print. So this enables us to uh, print out information to the the browser console. Um, and uh, this is just a simple print line. So I think it's just a yeah, just to help you see the reloading in action. Um, and one of the interesting things is we have this app state. Uh, so this is where we're going to put in any kind of dynamic uh, information, any of the information we want to change. Um, Reagent is going to help us uh, kind of manage this. Um, we we use this Reagent Atom, and an Atom is is kind of like a uh, a container uh, we can change. So it's a mutable container, so we can put things in and out of the container, and um, we can change the value. So it actually change it really changes the value. So unlike most of the rest of Closure. Um, this is this is a, a mutable uh, data data structure and um, and it is thread safe. Yeah, it's net thread safe. So if um, only one thread can access uh, this in terms of updating it, so, and we use uh, well, we'll see we use special functions to be able to update uh, the atom as well. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and then so the atom is just basically surrounding a normal immutable map. So the map itself is immutable, but we can replace this map with a new map, uh, and app state will be then updated. And then any components that we have the listening to this uh, app state will be updated uh, and pushed, and they'll be redrawn basically in the browser as we build something. So we've got a hello world component. And this is using app state. So whenever app state changes, then this uh, whatever this hello world function does, that will be called again, and the result of that would be pushed to uh, the browser, so we can see it live. When you say listening to, is it like do you subscribe to it and then it gets notification? Is that how it works, or? Uh, yes, but we don't actually. We don't actually. Well, the, our subscription is just basically giving it to the render components. Mm -hmm. So we've got this. So the, here we're actually just you, here. We've got an example of using uh, another function from the reagent library, um, but we're spec we're using the uh, the alias like we did at the start. So in the in the namespace, we've given this reagent core an alias of reagent. Uh, so any functions we want to use from that that aren't uh, the atom function, which we're including directly, uh, we can use uh, reagent slash and then the function name. So this is a function that comes from the reagent.call library. Um, and um, this, is how we, this is how we use it with the, with the alias that we've defined. Uh, this is the kind of the magic component that's, this is the magic function that helps us, uh, yeah, all our components listen to uh, things like the app state. So it may basically render components manages the, the life cycle of your components. So if there's a change, it will decide when uh, when it's going to redraw uh, things or when it's going to send basically DOM updates to the website to redraw your components in the browser. And you just simply give it a list of one or more components. So here we're using uh, a vector to just say, OK, well, our, our, our only component for this web page is the Hello World component. So if this changes or the app state changes, then 
reagent uh, will actually just re-render that and push it to uh, push it to our um, our web page uh, using this uh, is using this uh, bit of JavaScript interop. So we're going to basically call JS document. So that's the document function from uh, the like the core JavaScript library. And uh, we, we basically call element by ID. And we look for an, an ID that's got the, the name of app. Uh, and that's where Re Reagent is going to push our code into. It's going to inject our application into, uh, into the web page. Uh, so where, where did this it... JS come from, John? We haven't descri um, described it. We haven't required it anywhere. Is it, in, uh, is it native? It so JS is uh, is this is how we do the JavaScript uh, interop. Oh, so it's at a native call in closure. You just say JS and you yes. Talk to JavaScript. So if you want to include any of the so any of the function any of the functions that are part of the core JavaScript library, um, then you uh, you can call them just by doing JS document. So we don't just like you've got. Uh, functions in the core closure library and the core closure script library. Uh -huh. you, you don't need to include those. Right, of course. Yeah. Um, so now this is part of core core yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. But you can you can also include uh, other JavaScript libraries as well. And mm -hmm. um, actually there's a really nice just as an aside, um, if we go back to the web page. There is a web page called CLJSJS. Um uh, CLJ Yes, which provides, yeah, as it, as it says, it provides an easy way to, for ClojureScript developers to develop on JavaScript libraries. So if you want to use a JavaScript library with ClojureScript, then you just go here and search. There's 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 literally hundreds of libraries that you can use. And obviously, you can just go and search for the one you actually want. Uh, I don't actually know that. So you can include, if you wanted to, you just include React. I've done, done a little project where we just included React directly. And um, uh, this isn't typically how you would do it, but it's um, you would usually use Reagent or some similar framework to do it. But you could just include this as a dependency inside uh, inside your project and use React Native, uh, React JS uh, from the native uh, JavaScript libraries. Mm, I see. But uh, we use Reagent because it's uh, it's simpler. It's a lot simpler. Oh, okay. You don't have to uh, deal with the component model of, uh, of React JS when you're uh, when you're developing. So the only any real JavaScript bits we have to do here is just this single uh, expression where we're actually just getting element, getting the um, finding the right place in our web page. Where to put the the application? So if we go and look at the web page, uh, so let's go back up to resources. Uh, resources public, and if I look at the uh, the index HTML that comes with this, again you could generate this as well, but as um, having a page there, it makes it quite easy for. Other pe uh, other people to add uh, kind of like HTML or CSS to this very easily. Let's make that bigger. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, okay. And so this is just a normal HTML page, nothing particularly uh, different about it. And so we've got yeah, just some metadata in here. We're including. Uh, uh, an icon link. We've got some local CSS. So this is going, again, this is going to pull uh, CSS from the resources public uh, CSS style. So anything we've got in there, I'm pretty sure that's blank to start with. So it's just a, a normal style sheet. You can add your own manual set CSS files, and uh, you can also. And then there's nothing really in this body. There's a div. Uh, oh, look what the div is called. The div is called uh, app. Doesn't that sound familiar? Oh yeah, yes, I have a yeah. And so if we go video. back, if we go and switch back to the code. The, this is the this is the element you're looking for. Um, so we're looking for app, and then in our so in our HTML part, that's what uh, is is going to happen here. So this is where in this inside this div, 
uh, inside so this divider in, in HTML. This is where uh, the Clojure script is going to be injected to, or in fact, the, the JavaScript that uh, Clojure script is going to uh, create for us. This is where it's going to be put into. And you can see where this is coming from. So this in, we've got to our type inside our, uh, inside our build directory, we, we have this JavaScript uh, compiled library and it's going to create, uh, when we compile our Clojure script, it's going to create this Java, JavaScript file called my web. Yes. So we're just including that. And to, uh, in case something's broken uh, with that, instead of getting a blank file, we've got this placeholder text. So we've got a, a, head, a heading two and a little paragraph here. And um, if, if you see this, then it means your application isn't working because FigWheel isn't injecting the application over the top of this in, in this dev. So it would replace the content of this div uh, that's called app with your your application that's driven by uh, myweb.js. Make sense? Yeah. Oh. All very um, cleanly put together. Okay, dokie. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can do this to run this. If we go back to the terminal, uh, you can just run. Am I in the? Yeah. So I'm in the in the directory. You can just run line fig wheel. You can't run. You can't just say line real uh, line run. Uh, no, because you want to you want to basically drive the application from fig wheel. Uh, itself and um, uh, and that will basically that will compile that will start a closure script uh, that will start a closure REPL which therefore from that you can run it will automatically run a closure script REPL from there and um, and also launch a launch a browser and hopefully show your application uh, I'm actually going to do that in the editor. Uh, I didn't get anything when I ran line big okay, Let me try uh, again. Are you in the folder? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it does take a few seconds. It does, uh, it's obviously it's downloading a bunch of stuff from the internet. And um, let's just see if it works on the command okay, line. Okay, so, so, it's, here's it's, always the useful, it's always useful to check something out on the command line first. If it doesn't work on the command line, it's probably not going to work in your editor. It might take a few seconds to to build uh, the first time around because it's going to compile everything and put it into there and it's including reagent which um, yeah there's a, there's a few things in reagent to do it and we're not using the advanced compilation so we're not um, we're not doing any um, oh there we go other world oh you see so you just if you saw that just very briefly it had the the placeholder text and then it's replaced it with the actual application um, so if we go back to the Oops, go back to the source code. You can see that um, uh, that's not the right one we want to space them. Yeah, so it, it, if you very quickly noticed, it, it displayed this H2 heading, the fig wheel template, and check out your console. And then it very quickly, as it loaded the application in afterwards, then it, it basically ran render component, which then went to look at this hello world function. And it, it created a, a heading of H1 with the value that's in uh, text in app state. Uh, and then it's got some, it's got this H3 underneath that as well. So that's what we're seeing now in our browser. So this is our H1 heading. This is our H3 heading. Uh, we can go in, we should be able to go in and edit that in our browser. Uh, let's see. Let's do... Uh, oops. Uh, oops. I'll save that, and if we go back, so we've uh, we've changed this now. So if I actually move this to here and move this to there, then we can see that more in happening live. Uh, let's see. Save it, 
and pretty much instantly updates it. There's a little graphic that pops up in here very quickly. Uh, it's a little closure script logo, and um, it, it uh, just gives you an indi another visual indication that something's changed. Did you get that to work, Manny? Yes, I did. I'm just trying to reorganize my window so I can have it just like yours. Yeah. Uh, so I, I noticed there's a difference. I think maybe you don't use the shell inside Emacs because when I did line figvel inside Emacs, it didn't do anything. But when I did it in the normal shell terminal window, it did. Maybe there's something okay. wrong on my end. But, uh, anyways, yeah. it's, it's good to have the windows separate next to each other okay. rather than trying to get yeah. everything working inside Emacs. Yeah, the uh, the Emacs shell might not be picking up everything that's in your environment. There might be some uh, environment variables screen. missing. So. Graphics screen. Um, so the other way I can run it is uh, instead of running it on the terminal. So when I run it on the terminal and um, it, it, with this template, it's it's starting the uh, it, it starts it opens a browser a window or browser tab for you automatically. Um, it does need to do that in order to be able to connect to the the JavaScript engine in the browser. So then it can push the application, push the closure script application that's built into JavaScript. It can, it can push that into the browser. So you won't get a prompt until the browser has opened. Uh, so if the browser doesn't open for any reason, oops, uh, where is it now? Um, so then you just need to go uh, open localhost 3449. But I think it says that in the actual text somewhere. Um, uh, yeah, so it should show you where it is. Oops. Uh, yeah, so it basically says this is where the fig wheel server starting. So if your browser doesn't open, then you can go and connect to it um, uh, in that way. And there's lots of functions you can use to. Uh, to uh, run stuff uh, in FigWheel and get FigWheel status and so on. So if something's not quite working, there's quite a few uh, useful functions you can go and uh, use there. And obviously, if you want to quit the uh, if you want to quit the REPL, then you can do uh, colon CLGS quit colon CLGS quit. So it basically, just calls the quit function from closure script and pulls everything off. Uh, you can also run the application from uh, your editor as well. Um, you might need to add a bit of configuration for this to do this. Uh, I'm just going to show you. I'm going to test if it works to see if it's still working. So uh, instead of doing cider jack in, so I'm just doing comma, and then I'm going to do cider jacking closure scripts. So this should run fig wheel for me properly. So I'm going to do uh, comma double quote. Uh, Oh, did I press the wrong button? I just pressed the wrong button. Oops. Uh, oh, sorry, I've pressed the wrong button. There we go. Uh, so this is running a REPL now, and uh, hopefully that works. Oh, I can hide that. There we go. I'm going to hide that. There we go. Oh. Uh, did that not work? Hmm, that's not good. Uh, let me just check the messages. Oops. Oh, what are we doing? Uh, oh, there we go. It's connected. Uh, there we go. Uh, so let's have a look. Buffer space, buffer, buffer. So I've got, uh, I've got two. REPL. So this way, it's opening a closure REPL and a closure script REPL. So it kind of does that because it's it's kind of geared up for more of a full stack application. And um, this lining approach does, it, it basically runs a closure REPL. And then from that, it runs a closure script REPL on top. Uh, with the new approach, it kind of simplifies things a little bit more. Uh, but we'll look at that later. Uh, and if this isn't working by default in Emacs, then there's uh, in my uh, my uh, Emacs configuration in my dot space max configuration, I have a a section on closure. Um, uh, oops. 
Uh, let's see. So there is, you might need to set this um, CIDR CLJS REPL in there. If it's not prompting to you to, uh, to uh, as to which REPL you want to run, which I think they're starting to have now, then you might just need to kind of basically call these uh, functions. And this is kind of, it's what's defined in the actual template in the uh, dev space. Uh, but this all seems to be working okay. Uh, what was that file again? Uh, oh, sorry. Area so, it's, in your... so it's in my space max. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just in the space max, uh, uh, dot space max file. Uh -huh. um, it should be in my, it's in my, um, if you look at my gist, it's in there. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so we've got a simple website. Um, let's see, where is the, oh, there we go. Uh, whoops. Oh, oh, I don't want that. There we go. Uh, I don't want that. There we go. So we've got a website here, and uh, it doesn't really do an awful lot yet. Uh, so if we go back to the source code, um, space 10. And so the approach you take really is to, uh, you usually have like a main component that's your overall application, and you just start adding uh, content to that. We're using, using Hiccup. Uh, syntax, which is these, uh, so you see we've got these vectors. Um, so Hiccup is a, is a library that Reagent uses, so we don't need to include it directly. Uh, but it uses this Hiccup style. Uh, so rather than doing, uh, well, rather than doing the web page, uh, so the HTML code, so we're going to do like a H1 or a H2 in here. We have to do the angle brackets, and we have to have an opening tag and a closing tag. Simplify that, we... Uh, in Closure Scripts in, with Reagent, uh, we just use a vector. So we got a vector, and this is a tag. So these tags, pretty much all the tags you can use with HTML. So if if you can't find any documentation on how to do this Closure Scripts, then you can just basically copy uh, the HTML and just put the tag name uh, as a keyword. Uh, so with a colon at the front, and uh, and you put it into the vector. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Um, and um, yeah, so we've got a, a div that's going to surround. There's no kind of arguments to the div in this case, so it's just a divider. And we've got a H1 heading, and we got H3 heading. So rather than H3, we could change this to a paragraph. Oops. I want to paste it. There we go. Uh, and uh, and now we change it to a paragraph. I've saved that. Um, so it doesn't look any different. Did that work? Oh, uh, oh, maybe it's not running that properly. It should be different. It should be different. I don't think it's run. Uh, I don't think it's run fig wheel properly. I think I might need to change some configuration in that. I didn't have any issues. Oh no, I, I did. Ooh. Yeah, I'm just going to run it from the command line for the moment. Uh, it's, it's easier. It's oh no, you shut down the thing, right? I shut down the, the command line one. I, I was hoping to run it in Emacs, but there seems to be an issue. Rather than fix that, I'm just going to run it from the command line for now. Um, uh, I'm just going to make sure everything's closed. If I do, well, actually, let's go and look at the buffer. Cutting some food, just a second. <laughs> go and look at the, uh, is this doing anything? Oh, it should be working. Um, Why isn't this working then? It's cutting some food. Uh, Asking for a second. Um, yeah, it's open now. Figwheel template. Ooh. Hello world. Yeah, I'm beginning to like Figwheel. Right, good one. That looks different from the H3, so it has worked. I'm mm. uh, just going to. Uh, just going to do side equip and start that again on mine. Yes. Um, 
and see if there was any issues. Let me look at messages. Uh, so it's starting the REPL. So if you have any issues with, if you're using uh, Emacs, you're having issues starting things, you can always look at the the messages buffer. So just space buffer uh, M. Okay, that's asking me what I, okay. So the new version of CIDR does ask you which um, environment you want to run it in if it can't find a, a default configuration it likes. So I'm gonna use fig wheel for the closure script REPL. And hopefully that should set up the right uh, thing there. Oh, there we go. And it's working again. Cool, there we go. Um, so I'm, maybe I ex escaped that question before. Uh, okay, yep, so we're all working. And we've got iRid of fig wheel. And this is now a, um, if we look at this, if we inspect this, we can see this is now a, uh, oops, uh, this is now a uh, a paragraph rather than, ooh, it includes a lot of stuff there, a paragraph rather than something else. So it includes a lot of stuff in here, but you can also go and see like the sources of it in here, so you can browse. So like, learning to understand uh, how to use the, uh, the development tools is really useful as well. Uh, I'm gonna cover that in another section because otherwise we'll be here all day. Um, but there's some really nice tools there, and, you, and when you do, uh, when you get bugs, it'll actually show you the bugs um, on in the closure strip script code rather than uh, the close rather than in um, JavaScript because you can't you can't really debug JavaScript. So you need to be able to debug the closure script code uh, to be able to fix things. So we go back to the uh, source code. So if I did, um, did that and saved it, then I'd probably get an error. Ooh, I've broken it. I have broken it properly. Oh, maybe that's too much of an error. Uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. This is, uh, here we go, this is an example. So you get these compile warnings. If you can't compile something uh, correctly, then you get these little error messages here. Let's make that bigger again. And uh, it does give you, as you can see, I'll just make this a little bit bigger. So you can see it's actually giving you the error message in your closure code. So this is my def and closure code here. Um, and it, it's it's actually pretty accurate and actually quite nice. Uh, very nice kind of presentation of the error messages as well. Um, and so it's even giving you the line number to go and look at to uh, go and try and fix this. It's also telling you exactly where it's happening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oops. No wonder closure developers are getting lazier. Well, the, there's, there's plenty of work to do uh, if you're, uh, uh, rather than fighting your tooling, you should have the tooling supporting what you're doing so you can get, you can focus on the business logic. Um, okay. Uh, okay, let's fix, let's fix my code. So that is line 16, so that is correct. Uh, that's where the bug is, we save that and save it. And then it goes away. And you just saw the little green uh, closed script logo there as well. So it's really easy to add. Um, and then there is, if we wanted to make this look better, we can add things like bootstrap. So if it is, uh, I do have one of these uh, I did earlier. Uh, so if I go and look at my buffer list, I have, I think, where is it? Is it in there? Oh yeah, there we go. So um, you can also use, um, so we can basically, we can put our code into, we can put, uh, where are we? Um, so in our HTML, we could actually put uh, Bootstrap in here if we wanted to, uh, and include uh, the uh, the normal links you would get from Bootstrap. So we can go into the uh, Bootstrap. Let's copy some code from the internet. Yeah. Um, so bootstrap, uh, and then there's a, I usually use, you can either copy these locally if you want to and put them into the uh, resources 
public CSS uh, directory, but I, I quite like, because I'm usually online most of the time, I quite I prefer using the um, the CDN, the content delivery network. That you you saying use. you have a sleeping bag on uh, on in the internet, and that's where you're resting all the time? I'm always on the internet, yeah. So, um, yeah, so if we want to use Bootstrap, uh, we can use Bootstrap CDN, Content Delivery Network. And it basically just allows us to put in this link here. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, we can just basically copy that. Ooh, there we go. Uh, and um, into our code, our HTML code, just into our headers, um, which would be... Uh, it's those three lines, right? Uh, yeah, so you can include just the CSS, uh, or you can include, I'm going to put that in. But the CSS will only give you CSS. Yeah. Um, so you can include just the CSS, or there's, um, yeah, there's a JavaScript as well if you want to do uh, kind of basically a little jQuery stuff in there as well. That might be redundant uh, in this because we're we're basically using Reagent to do all that stuff. Um, it would be a little bit strange to to do either or. But if you wanted to do something outside of your application, something in is part of like a, a like a company template you had, then you might want to still use uh, like JScript, jQuery, JScript, uh, uh, jQuery uh, closure script from there as well, and. Um, and these are all, uh, both this one and, and the other one are all minimized uh, versions of these as well. So they're, they, they're going to be quick to quick to load, essentially. So they shouldn't be adding too much in there. But I mean, they will load each time somebody refreshes the page. But if it's a single page app, then you're only really going to get this hit the first time somebody comes across this page. Uh, so it should be fairly minimal. Why is Pepper and jQuery you uh, combined along with uh, Bootstrap? Uh, is Bootstrap depending on these two? That is a very good question. I haven't looked at this. This is, I guess, this is the new version of Bootstrap, so they've probably added some extra stuff in there as well. Yeah. As, okay. as with most, yeah, as with most projects, they're um, they keep on growing. Um, mm, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it gives you, it, yeah. Gives yeah, it says, it says here one. that you require jQuery and proper as our own JavaScript plugins. I see. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. So you can just include it like you would do in any other development uh, mm -hmm. there as well, and we can, and then we can just start using it. So the um, we don't need to do anything particularly uh, exciting. Oops, there we go. To to make use of it, we don't need to do anything complex to use it. Uh, Okay, but we should apply this now that we have uh, included that in our. Uh, we need to save it, yes. Uh, and then... done that. that okay. part's long done. Uh, oops. Go back to our. Uh, cool. So then we could add. Um, let's see, I do have some examples of what I've added in the other file. Oops. oops. Um, uh, I think I've got some here. So in this uh, in this example, so I, in this example, I've, I've included um, Bootstrap directly into the source code as well. So this is using this is using Hiccup um, HTML HTML five pages. So I'm gonna. I think this is online as well. I'll add a link to it uh, to this project uh, to this broadcast at the end. Uh, but if we, uh, yeah, so I can include, uh, formally include Hiccup in here as well, and I can use uh, like set up pages as well, which allows us to define templates and, and we can add forms and things. So there's quite a lot of things you can do in Clojure to be able to kind of do all the all the normal kind of HTML stuff you can do. You can do it in Clojure, and uh, it's a little bit easier to uh, to structure and to figure out what's going on and also refactor as well. Um, so here, for example, I've got a welcome page, uh, and I'm using this uh, HTML5 uh, function from Hiccup, uh, from the Hiccup web page section, and we're uh, we're including here we're including uh, Bootstrap CDN in this way. So you can you can do all from Closure if you want to, or you can put it into uh, HTML. It depends who's actually going to be doing 
like the, the the design of the web page itself if you if you got um one uh, people specifically just working on like html and css then having a, a separate index uh html file is does add um does make it easier for them to separate that workout and them just to work on that and then you can just inject your application if it's a developer, uh, if it's closed developers just writing everything, then I think it's nicer just to use Hiccup and include everything in uh, the welcome page as well. Uh, and then we can do things like, uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna copy some of these ideas here. So we can create a div, which is our container. Uh, so this is a class from Bootstrap. And so we, we have our uh, equivalent of a HTML tag in here as a div. And then we're adding a specific style to that tag. This is what the uh, this is what the map is doing. Uh, and because it's this is uh, just a normal closure map, then we need uh, key value pairs. So we can have one or more key value pairs in here. So here we've got uh, class, which is the um, is the type of style we're going to add to the div. Uh, and container as a string is is the actual name of the name of the class so we can go so in bootstrap somewhere there's a there's a class called container uh, and we're going to apply it to the div um, uh, let's go back to our oh. so if we if we make this div uh, and put a container on there as well uh, then it uh, it's a little uh, border around it. It's a bit hard to see on here because I've minimized this uh, a little bit, but you can kind of define styles on that. So that's not a very visual one. It's just containing everything. It's just uh, an abstraction, I think. The container. Yeah. The real the real deal is when you start adding more things around it. That's when it starts. You yeah. Know, putting so this yeah. Uh, this uh, jumbotron is quite uh, uh, an interesting one. So we can put a jumbotron around there. Uh, let's. Uh, And so, if we uh, are we going to have the, we're still getting the text from there, but we're going to add a style to this H1, which is going to be what Bootstrap calls a jumbotron, which is just a really big uh, header. And so that should oh, that's not playing ball today. My styles aren't loading properly today. Let's see. There we go. They're out of style. Is it? It's out of style. Um, yes. Uh, the browser's being a bit temperamental or something, I think. Um, well, yeah. But we can see we've added it, and it's put a yeah, it's put a, yeah, it's put a more of a margin around uh, the web page than it, than there was there before, which is a container, and we've added this gray grayish box around the H1, so it's just styled that, and um, so you can see the styles being applied fairly easily. And uh, and then what else have we got? What other examples have we got? Um, and here we've created a um, rows and columns. So we've basically created a structure from that. Uh, let's see. Um, let me just copy paste some of this as well. We can see what goes on. Um, but, Uh, copy everything and uh, oh, there we go. End of body. I do like putting the uh, kind of the end of body and end of container on these things sometimes just to make it a little bit easier where things are um, a little bit less clear. Well, if you've got lots of square brackets, it can be can be tricky to figure out where it is. So just to make a bit more readable code, sometimes nice to put these little end of uh, containers for the for the major uh, components like for. Uh, for the div body, so so actually, I don't want end of container and end of body in here. So I I can I just need to have the uh, this end of this div, which is the yellow one. You can also uh, yeah, I guess another way to do it is just uh, if you if you go into the Visual Select uh, and then do uh, percent, then it will it will choose the right uh, brackets for you as well. Um, but uh, if you if you don't have the magic of Emacs, then uh, or your editor is a bit limited, then putting like a bit of comment on where these things are ending could be quite useful. Actually, my uh, browser is also not rendering the jumbotron. I don't know how you got it to work. 
Uh, I just reloaded the browser. I get the um, same thing. Yeah. Um, so I want to keep that into the container. Oh. Um, um, did you save your code? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm just going to take that out. Uh, Maybe it's not regenerating the, the thing. Hmm. Let me do a line fig reel again. Uh, yeah, sometimes the cache can get a bit messed up. Sometimes you have to uh, it's probably in, Yeah, because it doesn't change in content, right? It changes in attribute. Mm. So you're right. It could be the caching. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we, got, oh, we don't want form either, do we? No. Um, uh, so I can, I can create uh, rows and columns. So this is just a row of 12. But if I make this, let's make that a paragraph. Uh, uh, and we make that three. Oh, you know what? I'm being a dumbo. Hmm? I'm changing this in the wrong place in the code. Ah, uh, that doesn't help. I no, yeah. What I had done is I'd copied the same bit into another section because I was experimenting to see what happens if I did that? Like I was just uh, experimenting with on JS load, thinking I can put some text in there, um, uh, and turned out to be not so great idea. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah. Okay. So here we got a couple of divs, um, and if I make this bigger, it should probably fit on the yeah. So there we can see we've got uh, a row, but it's got different columns in here. So I'm very, very easy to create columns just using, again, just using the bootstrap approach. And uh, I guess the, the trick is to figure out what's actually in bootstrap as well. So finding a good bootstrap tutorial will kind of s help you understand what the names of the, um, the names of the classes are that you're actually going to use. And then it's just a matter of uh, yeah, putting those as styles onto uh, onto whichever tags you've got uh, that are, are relevant. Say so we've just got a a row. This is our row, so we can have multiple rows if we want to. And inside the row, uh, there's there's different columns. When we when we have a like a short uh, a shorter a smaller browser window, then obviously it's putting one column underneath the other uh, because that's what uh, Bootstrap is doing for us. It allows us to have this um, dynamic uh, moving of uh, content based on whether you're looking on a desktop or if you're looking on a, uh, a mobile device. So it does that responsive design for you. Responsive, yeah, that's the word yeah. for it. Right? Yeah. And uh, let's make our website look a little bit prettier. Uh, let's yeah, John, a... show us your uh, web development skills. Uh, they're still prospective, growing. Prospective employers are looking at this. John, think about it like that. Uh, I might have to do a different video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You have only one chance to impress. You know that. Um, yeah, maybe I'll be a bit more uh, prepared uh, during a, like a, an interview thing. Uh, let's uh, open a file, uh, which is the... So I've started looking at the SVG components. There, there are a few libraries out there already, but I, I want to get back to basics and just create um, some uh, yeah, some scalable vector graphics uh, in, uh, in Clojure, because it's fairly easy. Uh, I mean, it all starts with this um, SVG tag that you can create. So this is just like, uh, just like a normal HTML tag. You can create an SVG tag, and um, you can very easily create uh, circles. So from the... Uh, from the SVG specification, this is how you would write it in uh, in HTML. But we're going to write it obviously in Clojure. Let's make that a little bigger. And uh, we can do things like ellipses and circles, and lines. So let's do an eclipse. Eclipse, right? yeah. Eclipse, yeah. Uh, let's copy that. Ooh, I didn't want to dock. There we go. So I can put in here inside. So that's in the div there. So rather than 
other than that, let's put our ellipse in there and get rid of this. So is that so Rx and Ry are radius, right? Yes. Um, what? Yeah. What have I done? Yeah. Why doesn't that go back there? There we go. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, eclipse. Is it eclipse or is it ellipse? Ellipse. E L L. Yeah. What am I saying? Not eclipse. Ellipse. E double L. E double L. Yeah. There we go. Maybe not. Are you sure? I thought it was only that. Uh, let's try circle. There we go. It complained about fill. Oh, yeah, because I had a character in there that didn't understand. Yeah, ellipse is correct. Was it? Why is it not drawing anything then? Oh, yeah, it took away my whole web page. I've done something wrong. Hmm. Uh, I've been punished. <laughs> Have I got that right? Um, oops. What are you getting? I'm not getting anything. It's not rendering for some reason. Uh, so does that ellipse need to be in a div? Uh, Can you put a div around it? I did put a div around it. Um, yeah. So if we go, um, oops, there's a lot of stuff in here. Where are we going? Why don't you use another one that you remember properly? Uh, like uh, what go. is it? Here we go. A rectangle. Did it work? Oh yes. Yeah, sorry, I didn't put in an SVG. Did I? I said you had to put everything in an SVG. And oh, well, you I, told me I, that, but you never. I, did. I completely ignored my own advice. Okay. How do <laughs> you now slope it in? I forgot the keys. Space. Uh, space K S. K S. Oh, perfect. It worked. Wow. Yeah. So let's do that as a circle, uh, but then we need to wrap it in an SVG. So let's put that. Yes. But I only now have a ellipse. My whole text is gone. Oh, because I have not put it in that other div. Oh, does it go and replace the previous div? Uh, That's probably what it has done. Yeah. And I have a space on, on top of that. Ah, okay, it's working now. You have a ellipse filled with like some green color, which looks like odd, but you don't have it at all. Um, I don't seem to have one at all. Let's let's get rid of this div. Hmm, how bizarre! How bizarre! Oh, something's. Oh, that's that's very broken. What's that? It's all right. Uh, it's not showing my. Uh, let's get this out of the div for now. Um, I'm getting a proper oh. view of it. I'm going to keep it in the div. I've broken my function somehow, I think. Oh, how did I do that? Hmm. I've broken my defin. Oh, that's okay. I've broken my uh, defin hello world thing because there's no. <laughs> I've somehow killed my closed bracket. How did I manage to do that? That's bizarre. Uh, you have an extra bracket somewhere in those middle divs. Uh, uh, nope. I don't have a round closed bracket. I don't have a closed round bracket somewhere. I've, I've got rid of it. I've destroyed it somehow. Maybe I put it into. Uh, oh, there it is. Yes. I think I slurped the reagent in by mistake. I think that's what I did. Uh, let's buff that out. There it is. There's my bracket. Well, all is good with the world now. Um, I think it should work again. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's the end of that div. Okay, we'll do. Um, so we add it in a in SVG. SVG. Um, we're gonna add a circle, which is in the back here. As we go, I put it in that div, and now. The div sh shows up, but not the circle. Oh, but circle takes different parameters, right? Uh, yes. So circle, um, it doesn't have some of the ellipse stuff. So there's it just uh, it's got a radius. It's got uh, uh, a uh, circumference of x, a circumference of y. 
or yeah, uh, the center of Y, and then it's got to fill. Yeah, it works now. Yeah. The why doesn't it throw an error if you're using an um, incorrect uh, set of parameters? Uh, it won't. Uh, I, yes, it for SVG, it. for SVG, it's it's just it's just a piece of data. So all it's doing is just interpreting the data. If you get the data wrong, then yeah, it's not going to help you uh, in that respect. Um, it's not as if it's a, as a function. With this is just interpreting this as a as a data. If you um, if you have uh, if you have a tag that's wrong, or if you have like a structure. So if I got rid of this, then it would probably give me an error. I think it makes sense because yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not a compiler error. It's just the yeah. data is not there. So if you get yes, yeah, so if you get a syntax error like that, then it's going to show that up. But in uh, in terms of data, it's it's data. So if you wanted to actually uh, manage that, you could use um, spec. So closure dot spec. Uh, would be an interesting way to if you if you had a whole bunch of common types and you wanted to make sure you weren't breaking the types, then you could basically define uh, a specification mm -hmm. for your for what a circle is and and if you tried to create a circle without that, then spec would tell you what was wrong with it and why why it was wrong uh, as well. So it would give you that information you're looking for. So it wouldn't be too difficult to uh, yet yeah, to add spec to uh, SVG, and that's a that's a really interesting idea for a future future broadcast. So thank you very much okay, for that. Okay, let's do yes. that. Yeah, is it a lot of work to put the spec in? Um, it's not a huge amount, but it's uh, spec is quite new, so it's um, there's just a bit of uh, a bit of learning there as well. So that's it's probably a a, a broadcast in itself. So. Mm. Maybe the next one. Maybe, uh, yes. Is there one happening after this? There is or one on, we yes. Could do that. So it was, uh, well, I've scheduled one for the 22nd, which should be in my channel as we speak. So if you go to my channel, you'll be able to see uh, the placeholder for that already. And um, I'll put links into the, the normal Slack uh, yeah, yeah. channels as well. That's great. Let's do some cool stuff. Yeah. So if you wanted to... To, uh, if you want to take this a lot further and create something like a game, then if I go to the practically, oh, practically, I've got a book called Practically Closure Scripts. Um, uh, and then I've got under the reagent program, so I've got this tic tac toe game. And it's uh, it's almost finished. I, don't, I haven't quite got the winning detection done yet, but. but this is uh, like a screenshot of the, the game in action. Uh, and it's just got a simple button. When you press the button, it basically just resets the app state to uh, to, the, to like uh, an empty board. Uh, and the board is just like a three by three grid, just uh, as you would get with a tic-tac-toe knots and crosses game. And then when you click, uh, so it's just you versus the computer component. And when you click on one of the squares, then um, the computer will automatically take its turn, and then you can click on uh, another square and so on, and hopefully try and beat the computer. Obviously, this has got a very uh, highly intellectual uh, AI-driven uh, move selection. Oh, really? No, How did you do not, that? No, not at all, really. <laughs> I thought just... you were calling some Amazon or Google service to get that thing. You that would be that. that would be interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would be interesting service. to uh, it would be interesting to add like a little rules engine uh, around this. Um, but basically, it just picks out the the a random uh, square from the ones that aren't currently occupied, and um, it's uh, so yeah. And then I just have to finish the the winning detection. So it's all the code source the source code is all on uh, here, and it's not that it's not that long actually. Um, it's, uh, I think it's like about 120 lines of code. Um, and uh, 120 lines of the same statement or different ones? Uh, different, different, different lines, different expressions. So it's got, again, it's using reagent. And so let's just make this a little bit bigger. It's using reagents. Uh, and it's, it's just, I just created this from a, uh, a, a fig wheel template, just using reagent as an option. I've got a game board that it creates. So this, so we define like the board dimensions. So we could potentially have like different size boards as well. Um, but it's basically going to create a 
a three by three or a something by something board. Uh, so we basically just uh, have this, we repeat the dimensions uh, empty. So we repeat three times and we create three empty keywords. We put that in the vector and then we do that whole thing three times. So this creates a row and then this creates the entire grid uh, and puts it into uh, a vector. So we end up having a three by three uh, cell of, I think I've got an example here. Is that what uh, repeat yeah. does? But it's a single line it puts it in, right? Uh, well, it, it does, but we do it three times, so we get um, we get a know, one we get a long line of nine elements, which yeah. is representing the, the three by three position. Yeah, so uh, we, we we would get we would get this kind of structure, but we would have the empty keyword in each of them. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Um, so yeah, because we each line, each each line is is represented by a vector, and then we have a vector that contains three of three lines. So we've got a vector containing three. Other Three vectors. Vectors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is empty a state as well, just like Tic Tac is? Yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I'm basically just using uh, empty uh, to represent uh, an empty cell. And then if, if you put, uh, if the play, if the human player puts it in there, I think I put them down as, uh, as crosses. And so then empty would be updated to, uh, to show a cross. And then uh, when the computer does it, then that value gets replaced by, uh, a, a a zero um, or a naught um, keyword. So um, yeah, as uh, well. This is interesting to show you. So uh, then everything is just managed in the state. So I've got a title for the web page. Uh, here we've got a board. Um, so this is just generating the board from uh, from that. So this is just generating the board from the uh, from this function. We so just you have a at. function called game board, and you give it dimensions. Yeah, yeah. So we pass in board dimensions, which it gets from this, um, and uh, it uh, yeah, and then generates the board and puts that into the atom. Uh, so so our app is put into the app state. So we can go and look at the board anytime we want uh, from any function inside here. And then just uh, we can also update uh, the board from any function that's inside the namespace. Uh, so we've got a move. So this is just how the computer moves. Uh, and it's just doing, uh, it's just generating a random nth for it. So it works out what the available cells are. Uh, and just basically uh, so it's, random not, number. it's not using any skill john <laughs> <laughs> well ra random random works well for most for a lot of things um so. actually you're right because um it's random is a lot more intelligent than uh, if you had to intuitively tell it what to select yeah or yeah programmatically tell it what to select and if you've ever watched the movie uh war games you know you can't win tic-tac-toe anyway so uh, it's impossible to win it uh oh, if you're really? playing against if you're playing against a computer that's that's that that's really smart then you're always going to end up with draws so at least you've got a bit of a chance with uh with random yeah to, to be able to win it uh, this is just the the to sweeten the pot so you walk into yeah, it and yeah yeah then be able suddenly to make the... the computer changes into like either a human being or another computer and yeah, then I, you have had it <laughs> I, I guess the, based on the level if you, could, if you have different levels or how many games you played then you could then start kind of making the uh uh, adding some AI to the decisions of the computer yeah. player as well. Well, you never know. Somebody in the closure world might just replace the random function with something smart. <laughs> if it's been used that'll in a tic-tac-toe program. That would ah. be confusing. Yes, that would be confusing. Uh, so I've just got a function that uh, generates an empty cell, uh, and it's adding this uh, this on click to uh, that, uh, that each cell. So when we generate an empty cell, we, we add this on click to each of them. And so when we click it, then we basically uh, it just prints out a little uh, statement to the command line, so just for debugging. And then we, uh, as we're clicking on it, uh, click on the empty cell. We want to be able to put in, oh uh, yeah, so the human player, uh, yeah, the human player is, is not in this case. Uh, so we're basically just updating the app state with this swap command. We need to use swap because uh, the app state is an atom. And then we're just going to associate in. Uh, in the atom where the keyword board is, we're just going to basically uh, the Excel Y so we're just going to basically add that uh, instead of empty, it's going to be naught, uh, and then and then immediately the computer is going to do a move as well. Um, so as soon as you clicked on something, then the computer moves 
so you can't really undo the move in this case. Mm -hmm. So it's just a quick hacky way of doing it. So that each cell has has that kind of thing in there, and um, well, each empty cell has a an on click, and then to stop people be, be able to change the moves, then the once it's a once it's a cell not or a cell cross, then we don't have uh, an on click on those, so you can't actually click on those again. Um, so it's, it's a very simple way of doing that. Uh, mm, okay. And and these are just basically drawing uh, the SVG in uh, in the um, uh, in there. So this is just drawing a circle. This one is a bit tricky. Doing a cross is a little bit more tricky. We've got basically two lines, and we are yeah. basically just translating the lines so that they cross over each other. <laughs> and uh, and that's how it works. So yeah. So this is a purple and white, uh, and and yeah. And so the circle is. It's got a fill, which is white. So this basically makes it, rather than a circle, this makes it an O because we put a fill in there of a certain of white, and the the stroke around it is green. So um, yeah, so this is a this is a green. So, so this it looks is a white. Nice, though. Whatever you've yeah, done, yeah, yeah. it oh, looks yeah, yeah. really nice, simple it's, and nice. Yeah. So this is a white circle, but the stroke, which is this part, is, is we've made this green, so it looks like an O. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it looks like a rather than creating two circles one on top of the other we can just create a single circle uh and color the middle color the the main part of it white and the out, uh, out the the border the the stroke of it green mm. and that's how it, that's how you do this mm. uh, john can you go back to your previous function not the cell and the knot but the other one uh the computer uh, was it empty i think was it it was no empty yeah uh, cell empty yeah not cell empty before that before that, it was the computer move. I think so. Yeah, you said you said you did something with that. Uh, and what was before computer move? Uh, this is just the uh, the app sending the app step from the board game, and that's board game. Uh, okay, it was computer move then. Yeah, what were you explaining here? That was there was something you said here about uh, while you were explaining about the next move, if next move. Uh, yeah. So all this is doing is it's it's just figuring out what the uh, available. available are. Yeah. So I, I think I can probably use a filter for this. Actually, uh, maybe I'm not sure. Oh, well, so it's basically going to iterate over each line in in each column, uh, and then when it's empty. Uh, so if it's if the value of that is empty, then um, uh, we're going to get the column and row. Uh, and then that's going to be all our available sets. So we've got a bunch of, uh, so our next move can be whenever there's uh, like the available cells uh, are free, we can choose, we can do a run, run to nth. So we can generate a random number uh, from the available cells uh, and that's the move we're going to make. So our next move here is then used uh, to, yeah, uh, we can take the first of that. Um, so we're basically going to run to nth all the available all cells. All the available cells. We take the first one from that uh, and the second one from next move. So we've got like the X and Y positions. Mm -hmm. And then we're just basically swapping into the app state. Uh, we uh, okay. associate in, associate the, in. the okay. cross. So it's very much like that's, the... That's augmenting that position, right? When you say associate in. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so it's replacing, replacing, uh, it's yeah. replacing in board. Um, I, at this at this X and Y kind of location inside across. the grid, uh -huh. uh, it's going to put a cross in there. Yeah, mm. but but we we first work out what are the available cells, yeah, yeah, exactly. what are the cells are, are, are empty. There's are you checking? A, are you checking if you even have any available cells? Is that if next move? The uh, check no, I'm not. I, I guess I'm not checking to see if there's any available cells uh, left. Yeah. Um, so because that's, if there aren't any available cells, you can't put across. Oh well. I, well, I, uh, oh, there's. A, yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Actually, yes, I am a checking here. So yeah. The, if, if move, I thought that. If, move, if yes. next move. Yeah. There we go. It, it was a while since I wrote this. So if if there's a next move available, uh, then we then we make the move. Otherwise, so this is the true part of the if. Uh, and then if there's a false, then we just print out. So there's no more things. But I, again, I could do something visual on the board uh, on that as well. Um, uh, but hey, hey, you lost. I would do something more uh, positively constructive that helps the learning process, obviously. Um, and replace the random end with like a smart move function. Yeah. Maybe I should do that. Yeah. 
And so the the game itself is fairly simple. It's just, you start a new game. You draw the uh, the the grid uh, by just iterating over the, the board state. So we've we've already got our board, which is our vector of vectors in here from upstate. And so we just basically create uh, x and y cells in there, and um, and then based on uh, the upstate, we can see whether they're empty, cross, or not. I think, and and then we can draw the uh, the relevant uh, uh, yeah we can draw the relevant graphic in here. So this is a function called call the the graphic um, uh, that we want to draw in that in that x and y position. So that's drawing the that's basically just drawing the update board for us, and the tic tac toe is the component that uh, just gets called by reagent. Whenever there's a change in upstate, then this tic tac toe board will get uh, function will get called and update the board there for us. Mm. And there's okay. a there's a whole bunch of oh there we go so yeah so this is this is what the board looks like to start with and then um, there's some kind of experiments about how to create the board as well so I can show you how I've evolved that. And then how to iterate over a board of the board structure, and um, uh, and the, you, I did get an interesting uh, feature of React. It wants to have a unique key for every uh, every cell uh, in there. So um, there's some aspects on that. Unique key uh, for what? Well, it, it's just uh, it's reagent. It's so sorry. It's React JS likes to have a, a unique uh, key, so you might get some warnings about. Uh, each cell doesn't have a unique uh, key for the for the tag. So every every kind of tag in uh, Reagent wants uh, wants this kind of key metadata in there. And um, I'm not sure if I fully fixed that or not, but um, it, it just might get some warnings. It still doesn't affect the, how the game works. Uh, but uh, everything uh, in React wants this kind of unique ID so it can it knows what to talk to. Mm. Uh, given a specific ID, but you can just generate that as metadata if you if you really get annoyed with a warning. So I just switch the warnings off, which mm. I think I did in the end. But that's good. That's actually for uh, resolving I mean, future problems. Yeah, I mean for this kind of level, it's not important. But yes, ah, that's uh, true. But but, uh, but uh, it yeah, was a production a, ready application. If, then. Very, if you've got a very complex web app, uh, web application, yeah. then it could be quite useful. And this is just some experiments about how to, uh, yeah. So here we've got the ASOC. So this is we take the board, and then we can kind of we can we can basically give the board like some fixed positions, so we can test uh, things out as well. So I'm just using the uh, the reader comment here, mm -hmm. and I can come in and just go and evaluate. So if I ever wanted to reset the uh, the board to a particular uh, position for any kind of testing I wanted to do. Then it's very that's that's how we would do that. Uh, so this is like testing like winner position. So this is not winner. Um, is this this is a cross winner because uh, we've got three crosses there diagonally. Mm, diagonal, okay. Yep. Uh, and uh, we've got to reset so we can reset the state if we want to as well. So this all helps with the interactivity of of playing the game. Um, Actually, you can create your not uh, your sorry your smart move very easily. I'm sure I can. Yeah, no, I'm thinking I'm like this is one approach is you, you have a finite number of ways that makes you win, right? You've got diagonal, a horizontal, and vertical. So if you give a if you tell the board, if you create those kinds of boards, you'll have to just create yeah. uh one, two, three, four, five of those boards, or six, seven, eight boards, and tell it how can you reach the quickest way to one of these positions. And it can yeah, then so, learn, learn yeah. to create those boards. Yeah. So one of the things I was thinking about was just doing pattern matching. So like basically yeah. comparing the vector of vectors. So if it's if it's this, then uh, the knot has won. If it's that, then cross has won. And there's there's quite a few. Uh, I guess there's quite a few combinations to do that. So you would need to generate, but you could generate all of those fairly easily. Uh, you yeah, but if you create boards for if you create boards for x, it's the same applicable for the cross, the same applicable for knots as well. So you're not actually creating two different boards; you're just using the same principle for both. Yeah, boards. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I could write the smart move function. I, I should look forward to your pull request. Yeah, where is this? It's on uh, J Rocket. It's, uh, yeah, so it's on. Uh, there we go. Um, it's uh, it's this J Rocket tic tac toe reagent 
Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so it's all there. And, uh, I still have the closure homework to finish. So let me do one yep. thing first, not jump into too many things. Yep. But this is interesting. I kind of like the way you've put it. So I can just plug in the function very easily. Because instead of saying random nth, all you do is um, call this smart move function, which gives you a list of positions in, in the order in which it can win. Yeah. And then you can choose the first one because it's the most likely order in which you'll win, for example. Yeah, so if, I think for this game, then that's fine because uh, there's only a finite uh, number of moves for chess. Then obviously that would be insanely difficult to do for something like chess because there's there's an infinite number of yeah. winning positions as well. So you would need to kind of uh, do something more intelligent for chess. True. Uh, but for tic tac toe, it, it, it's fair. it's it's doable to kind of just do a, a pattern matching. We we're almost doing a, a finite state machine essentially, I guess. Because uh, if it's if it's this and this and this, then it's win. Otherwise, it's uh, as uh, yeah. If it's this, uh, if it's this pattern, and then it's it's not, then not wins. Uh, if it's this pattern and it's cross, then cross wins. Uh, if it's none of these patterns, then uh, yeah, you keep on playing, keep, keep unless, on playing. unless unless the board. Oh uh, yeah, if you, if it's none of these patterns and there's no spaces left, then it's a draw. It's a draw. Yeah. And if there's still spaces left, then it's a win. So yes, yeah, four, four four different states for a finite state machine, and then you just do the pattern detection for uh, two of the states. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, if anybody, if if Manny or anybody else wants to do a pull request, that'd be most acceptable. Somebody also, uh, a dojo actually did. Did they do a pull request? No, they didn't. Um, they did actually animate some of the SVG things as well. So I guess if you use the transform function, like we did with cross, then you could animate some of the uh, some of the moves as well. Uh, that was quite fun. Um, so if you look at cell cross. We didn't transform, but you could set up a little loop that kind of transforms them over and over again and get a little mm. bit of animation there as well. That, that'd be quite cool. Uh, but yeah, something something to uh, for another lesson. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, yeah. So the I, I do walk through this step by step in the in the web page in this in this uh, tutorial, uh, uh, which uh, does should still work very well. Just steps through creating a project, uh, step by step everything we've done today. So if you did miss something, if you or if you prefer just following uh, this browser rather than um, uh, rather than the uh, the video, then yeah, this will help you. Uh, create your own tic-tac-toe and you can even use your own colors and symbols the way you could even change this. I'd be quite interesting to see, um, yeah, different symbols and animated symbols. That'd be quite cool. Cool. John, I think you might have a couple of questions in the, in the oh, YouTube channel. I, uh, I forgot completely about those. Oh yes, I did. Mm -hmm. yeah, Do you have a full app on GitHub that shows menu items, forms? Uh, I, I'm working on uh, an app that has like forms and so on. So the status monitor that I'm looking at, I, I need to push some of the code there that I is not there. So if we go to, um, uh, oops, uh, if you're going to look at my repositories, oh, that's a big picture of me. Uh, so the status monitor. Uh, this is this is uh, just my experimental playground for like SVG graphics as well. Ooh, there we go. Uh, but I'm going to put some forms and things in here as well if I haven't done already. Um, so in the handler here, uh, I've got uh, I've got some mock data. I'm going to like generate some mock data and then like show the data uh, in uh, in SVG. So visualize some of the data. And I think I was about, yeah, I'm starting to work on some form stuff here. Uh, there's actually, if you look in Hiccup, um, there's some good kind of examples there, but I'll start to add some uh, form information there as well. Um, uh, what are the questions have we got? Uh, OK, um, yes. Uh, Oh, we've got two more questions if we scroll up. Oh, uh, it doesn't scroll up on there. Let's, let's have a look at. Do you have a scroll up button on your computer, John? They, uh, yes, but not on the iPad. The iPad cuts uh, off the uh, questions. 
Let's go and oh, let's let's like where is that? Boom. Default view. Let's go and have a look at the. Oh, there we go. Uh, the modern CLGS GitHub pages. Tried the app. Yeah. Um, the thing with the modern uh, CLGS GitHub pages is it's not longer no longer really that modern. Um, I had a lot of problems trying to get that modern CLGS uh, GitHub working. Um, uh, so there's, there's some interesting stuff there, but I, I think some of the some of the libraries and stuff are out of date. I never quite got far enough for um, uh, for actually understanding um, how uh, how to make it all work. So I, I'd I'd kind of suggest moving away from that. The there are some newer um, uh, some newer tutorials, and I'll, I'll dig those out and put them into the links as, as I as I find them. Um, there's some other questions on uh, which is better for new starts, fig wheel or shadow CLGS. I was going to mention, um, did I do that? Uh, I was going to mention fig wheel, uh, fig wheel main. Uh, so if you go to figwheel.org. Uh, so for building websites, uh, I'd still recommend fig wheel. So either fig wheel. Uh, as we've just covered, uh, or if you want to be on the slightly more leading edge stuff, then there's something called Fig Wheel Main, which is where most of the, the new work is going on. There's, there's nothing wrong with using Lining and, and Fig Wheel as it is, but um, you can also do it with uh, Fig Wheel Main. And there's a nice uh, tutorial somewhere in here, uh, which will go through and help you run that. So I might do another one uh, on building this kind of thing, but using the uh, Fig wheel main. The main difference is rather than using um, Clojure as a library, it's using the Clojure CLI tools, and uh, so you can do a lot more on the command line in this in this way as well. And they've updated some of the uh, the ways you use it as well. So it, it's kind of it's a much nicer, more polished uh, kind of experience as well. So it's all the goodness of uh, existing lining and but if you're going to do web development single page apps, then I think this is going to be the future when you as, as to when you move to the future, I think you can still do good things with uh, lining and as we've done, but you might want to start looking at this for for new projects as well. Uh, this is a pretty good tutorial. It's quite it's kind of low level. It's not really building much, but um, I'll try and convert this into uh, a tutorial where we we build uh, tic tac toe again, but using this that might be a, quite a nice uh, variation. Uh, and then Shadow CLJS uh, is really good if you want to use, uh, if you're doing, um, if you're using Node, basically, if you're going to build your application on top of Node, then Shadow CLJS has more advantages because it makes it a lot easier to use the NPM uh, packages from uh, yeah, from NPM. So you can use the JavaScript NPM packages that way. Uh, and I'm afraid I don't really know what browser sync is unless that's something in Clojure Scripts. Uh, but essentially, what we're doing with Fig Wheel, whichever version you're using, it's basically compiling the Clojure Script into JavaScript and then pushing it into basically updating the JavaScript in the browser uh, JavaScript engine. Uh, uh, so if that's browser scripts, I'm not sure if that's the same as browser sync. Oh, are those Fig Wheel commands? I'm not quite sure. I'd have to look in the fig wheel um, uh, documentation, to be honest. But I'll have a look, see if I can find what that is. Um, the documentation is pretty good in there as well. But obviously, they've, um, they're more focusing on this fig wheel main now, which is the in the fig wheel.org. Did that answer those questions? OK, excellent stuff. Uh, I just set up app package build and host. Um, just reading the questions, but I'm still sure to manage that. Yeah, so Shadow, uh, yeah, so, um, okay. Uh, so we, we haven't really, yeah, we haven't really covered the, the life cycle of getting all this deployed. Um, with uh, with lining in, uh, if you're if you're doing a full stack uh, one a full stack web application, that's simple. You can just be an Uber jar because your your backend's closure script will just be probably using uh, an embedded jetty. So you can just deploy the whole thing as an Uber jar and it should just work. 
Um, and uh, but if you're just going to do front end stuff, then obviously you need to run it in an environment. Uh, you could actually just create, uh, take the JavaScript file if it's all self-contained. You take that and just put it into uh, like a web page and um, uh, and just run it on GitHub Pages. It's a simple way to do it, uh, or you could include it in part of a tooling uh, pipeline with uh, with the, the normal JavaScript tools. But you'd probably want to generate. You still want to generate the closure scripts uh, from uh, from the closure uh, from the Fig Wheel tooling because that way it will give you the um, the closures. Uh, it'll give you the Google Closure compiler optimizations, especially for production. Um, so there is some information on that. Uh, again, I'll see if I can find some really useful ones to follow as well. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Um, yeah. Uh, if there's no more questions, I'm going to leave it at that because oh, it's getting on for nearly two hours. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's my one hour 45 one minutes. Wow. The longest one yet. So uh, I might see if I can cut out the boring bits uh, in post production uh, if there was any. And um, oh, we've got one more question. And uh, but yeah, so I hopefully found that useful. And um, I will uh, endeavor to do something more in the, along these lines. We did actually cover uh, all the like several different uh, web frameworks in. Uh, in the workshops we did at Hack the Towers, so we went through uh, React Native, uh, so not React Native, uh, React JS, just directly, Reagent, Reframe, and uh, an OM. And Reagent seems to be the easiest uh, to build simple applications. And uh, if, but if you want to build something more production-wise, then Reframe is certainly an application that's worth looking at. Reframe is just basically. Uh, could design decisions up, up on top of Reagent, so it helps you kind of leverage the, some of the experience of building web apps with ClojureScript uh, that other developers have come across. And uh, but there are quite a few others out there as well that have some interesting aspects. Uh, so a demo on using ClojureScript front end with existing web app built on Spring Django. Ooh. Um, that could be interesting. Uh, I don't really do Spring Django things, but I shall, I shall certainly consider that, uh, like how to do a, a CRGS one. Uh, essentially, if you've got if you've got an API, what might be quite useful rather than like specifically Spring and Django, I can show a closure scripts front end that basically talks to an API uh, and do it that way. Uh, that might be, and then because that's probably the way you either want to. Do use an API, or you set up some kind of AJAX or web, web sockets uh, connection between the back end. Uh, those are, are typically the approaches I've seen. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. There's no more questions. I think I'm going to leave it at that and go and feed my cats because they're probably quite hungry by now. You're looking at me in, with a funny, funny space. So <laughs> thank you very much for uh, joining, and I will see you next Saturday. Is the so Saturday the twenty second is the next one I've scheduled. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, John. Have a great day. Thank you, Barry. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Let's stop sharing my screen. Let's stop.